ChatGPT, the new favorite toy of copywriters and scriptwriters, has garnered considerable attention in recent times. To shed light on ChatGPT's uniqueness, I would need to compare it with Google and Wikipedia, as these are the media that it will try to replace or obsolesce. New technologies always seem to challenge or substitute the technologies that preceded them, hence explaining what ChatGPT is without touching on the technology that it might replace or challenge would be incomplete. As a pinnacle of electronic technology, Google stands in direct contrast with what Marshall McLuhan called the visual age of Gutenberg's world. Before the advent of electronic technology, followed by the World Wide Web, Western culture's core values were different. As McLuhan points out, the left hemisphere dominated typographic men of books and Renaissance perspective were all about lineality, perspectivity, fixed point of view, one at a time approach, continuity, sequentiality, and abstraction. In other words, McLuhan took individualism and the linear left hemisphere intellectuality to be an archetypal example of the visual Gutenbergian world. The representatives of this age he referred to as typographic men. The best example of a typographic man who lives as a form of vestige is Noam Chomsky, a person whose central nervous system is immunized from the electromagnetic radiation that limits people's attention spans and causes worldwide amnesia. McLuhan's understanding of visual age somewhat maps onto Deleuze's concept of arbor-centric worldview, where knowledge and information are assembled in a hierarchical manner. Now, after the advent of electronic technology, the world was contracted into what McLuhan called the global village. The speed of light abnegates the spatial extension and Cartesian coordinate system of the left hemisphere. It causes an implosion and hence contracts the outward-oriented Gutenbergian West into the huge cavern of electronic technology. The internet contracts the globe into a brimming tribal village and creates an acoustic cavern similar to how Tefnut encircles the world in Egyptian mythology, except that the new sheath that encloses us is electromagnetic. McLuhan takes the electronic world to abolish all the principles of the visual world, such as the linear approach to the subject matter, left hemisphere one at a time stance, a logical continuity, left hemisphere hyperfocus, etc. Rather, the world of electronic technology is more right hemisphere, in virtue of its being analogous, discontinuous, tactile, instantaneous, and mosaic. It demands global attention and skills of pattern recognition, as opposed to the left hemisphere focused attention of a typographic man. That's why the multiplicity and existence of multiple sources of information that are disconnected brought conspiracy theorists into being, as the electronic world favors right hemisphere dominant people who are generalists and try to come up with some form of unifying meta-narratives. This then somewhat resembles the principle of rhizome and schizophrenic state that is explored by Deleuze and Guattari in Thousand Plateaus and Anti-Oedipus. For them, schizophrenia can be viewed as a positive occurrence, as such a person views the world differently. In their view, schizophrenia involves a kind of deterioration of the mind, in which fixed categories and boundaries are broken down, leading to a sense of disorientation and fragmentation. The information then is deteriorated and ripped from different sources so that they can be amalgamated into a typical Wikipedia article. Deleuze then considers the fragmentation and disorientation characteristic of schizophrenia to be a gateway to new forms of experience. As we are going to see, the schizophrenic effect of the internet with its online encyclopedias and Google could be reversed and changed by chat GPT. Google as a search engine not only substitutes books and printed material in its quickness and up-to-dateness of providing information, but creates a new paradigm of learning. One key principle that differentiates the right hemisphere electronic acoustic world from the visual left hemisphere world of books is all at oneness. Namely, on the internet, you are struck with vast disconnected pieces of information that strike you all at once, whereas with books, you are engaging with fixed points of view, following a narrative that is supposed to be coherent and well put together. 
In this regard, Google is schizophrenic, as the multiplicity of the material provided on platforms like Wikipedia, let's say, is mostly an amalgamate of information scraped together without uniform connectivity and absent centralizing force that unifies information into a meaningful narrative. As cultural critic John Ebert states, one can come back to the same Wikipedia page and find the information that we read to be completely changed or deleted as now information has lost its ground and binding of the Gutenbergian hardcover books. This then maps onto a rhizome's principle of decalcomania and cartography, in which maps or traces can be constantly reworked or revised. The map is open and connectable in all of its dimensions. It is detachable, reversible, susceptible to constant modification. It can be torn, reversed, adapted to any kind of mounting, reworked by an individual, group, or social formation. Rhizome, a theory of connections that tries to account for the phenomenon of horizontal multiplicity, nicely maps onto basic properties of the internet and of Google. Rhizome is a horizontal web of the matrix, as opposed to a tree which grows vertically. Although older versions of the internet are more arbor-centric and hierarchical, the new blockchain systems and decentralized web resembles the rhizome in its absence of the guiding center. A Wikipedia article, unlike a book, won't collapse if you pull a segment out of it, as you are dealing with different types of information put together in somewhat non-linear and non-uniform manner. A book, on the other hand, is consistent with itself and forms a tree-like structure where roots are defined in the first few chapters and you reach the pinnacle in the end. Hence, according to the fourth principle of the rhizome, the asignifying rupture, if you destroy one part of the rhizome, it won't cause a collapse of the whole system. The rhizomorphic structure will adapt to it and grow in a different direction. The internet, like a rhizome, is decentralized, as it is run by multiple nodes, which are coming from different spaces across the globe. Book, and as we are going to see, the chat GPT, incorporate arborocentric structure where the given information is centered around the fundamental principles and core philosophy that will define and structure information, the same way a magnet gives pattern to dispersed iron filings. Now, Google provides you with multiple sources of information that are not organized in a hierarchical fashion, where one article would have an epistemological superiority over another. Now, I understand that because of political censorship, Google might block out some type of information, but theoretically, it is supposed to be rhizomorphic. The disconnectedness of information prompts you to put it all together, as there is no narrative or author behind a typical Wikipedia page, let's say. Rather, you are engaged with multiple anonymous authors providing information from different points of view. Now, the key aspects of acquiring information from Google is all at oneness and quickness. Mostly elder people were pretty happy about the internet and its usefulness in its ability to provide information in a matter of seconds. However, it is worth noting that people whose brains were formed in the age when the internet was not around are immune to the vices of electronic technology. Here I will list the major problems with trying to learn something from the internet. First, it weakens your working memory and long-term memory. You see, before Google came in, if you were curious in finding out answers to the questions that bothered you, it was somewhat mandatory to engage in a series of social slash intellectual steps. First, you would need to question people around you and attempt to find answers in books or encyclopedias that you might have found in your household. Next, if that hadn't sufficed, you would have gone to the library and searched for the relevant material there. Now consider that in that very process, you are not actually wasting any time. You are actively contemplating the question and possible answers, stimulating your imagination and working memory. This process ascribes emotional valency to your intellectual quest, which in and of itself serves the basis for the long-term memory, as the amygdala, the emotional part of the brain, plays a huge role in memory formation. Not only that, but in that very process, you are creating a spatial mind map of your journey, which would also give quality to your journey. While getting to your answers, you would have probably been forced to go through the material that is related to your question, hence acquiring the necessary context and knowledge surrounding the topic. 
as opposed to getting a decontextualized factual knowledge in a matter of seconds, which will never get into your long-term memory. Now, the instantaneity and all-at-oneness of the internet negatively impact your memory and attention span in other ways too. Marshall McLuhan differentiates cool media from hot media. Cool media, such as old grainy low-definition TV, seminars, telephone, comic books, and cartoons are participatory. In other words, they are low in definition, meaning that you have to fill in the gaps and engage in a reciprocal dialogue with the given material. Comic books and cartoons aren't easier to memorize just because we engaged with them in childhood. By virtue of them being low definition, such media invite consumers to cognitive participation. The absence of visual sharpness and complete imposition of information offers people the opportunity to interpret and engage with the given material. Now, the hot media, on the other hand, do not invite participation. High-definition films, photographs, lectures, and textbooks are complete and extend one particular sense in high definition. Radio, for example, as a hot medium, extends the ear and doesn't leave room for much participation. In the same way, HD films with high resolution do not leave much space for interpretation and participation. You won't fill in the gaps when watching a high-definition film. One experiment compared different media to see which one was the best for teaching. TV, radio, lectures, and text were used to give information about proliterate languages to four randomized groups of students. Keep in mind that we are speaking about the old grainy TV that existed as a little box in a typical American household. After being given an hour and a half to study the materials, the students were tasked with taking a quiz to assess their understanding of the subject matter. The first place went to TV, as unlike the three hot media, it is a cool medium that invites participation and stimulation of memory and imagination. Now, in the next phase, all four media were given full freedom to expand their potentialities. For radio and TV, the material was dramatized with many auditory and visual features. The lecturer took full advantage of the blackboard and class discussion. The printed form was embellished with imaginative use of typography and page layout to stress each point in the lecture. Unexpectedly, TV fell to the second place and radio took the first. What caused such a change was not clear in the beginning, but then things became apparent. TV, by virtue of being a cool participatory medium, failed when being hotted up by dramatization and hence performed worse as there was less opportunity for participation. Google can be classified as being on the hotter side of the media spectrum. It just splits out information that it can find and slaps you with it without any introduction provided. While experimenting with ChatGPT, I found it to be unique in terms of learning. At first, it is more related to a book than it is to a Google as the text that it generates doesn't involve the principle of multiplicity. Hence, ChatGPT, while holding onto good aspects of Google, such as having access to multiple sources of information, retrieves the lost aspect of arbor-centric, organized, and centralized narrative formation that existed in the epoch of the printed books. You have a feeling that the text is coming from a single author who is forced to sound coherent. It doesn't invite you to unending abyss of multiple points of view and decontextualized pieces of information, but rather scraps them together in a way that sounds more human and more organized. This then contrasts Deleuze's schizophrenic state of deterioration and fragmentation, which holds true for typical search engines like Google. Secondly, like a living human being, it remembers the previous questions that you asked, which will influence the answers that it is going to give you in the future. Hence, taking your previous questions into consideration, it is more dialectic. This negates the rhizomorphic property of having multiple entries where one specific introduction doesn't possess an ontological or epistemological monopoly. Here, by virtue of chat GPT, remembering your first entry question, which then influences its subsequent answers, retrieves the vertical and hierarchical model of information formation, which one definitely needs to stay sane. 
Thirdly, the very process of typing and sometimes deleting the words and retyping them creates a sense of process and linearity as opposed to all at once and simultaneity. It's as if you have to follow the train of thought instead of being struck with a dead piece of passage provided by Google. I would absolutely love ChatGPT to slow down when typing a message, as it makes the process more lively, forces you to exercise your working memory, and stimulates curiosity. When asking a question to ChatGPT, why shouldn't browse away before it generates the answer, but rather stay with it the whole process? Fourthly, the very fact that it is a chat medium resembles a telephone, which is a participatory cool medium. You asking questions that are most times impossible to ask on Google creates a sense of dialogue, which is way better for the learning process than engaging with a search engine. Now, to summarize the properties of ChatGPT, it would sound like this. It brought back the linear train of thought that you can follow, the participation in virtue of back and forth exchange, fixed coherent answers, and the absence of unending multiplicity, which creates a more learning-friendly environment. The supposed freedom that Google offers you is not actually a freedom. The constant decision-making that one engages in while internet surfing wears down our prefrontal cortexes and dopamine reserves. ChatGPT, on the other hand, with its minimalism and one-at-a-time answers, is way more merciful on our prefrontal cortexes, as we're not forced to engage in a huge number of micro-decision-making processes. Hence, engaging with ChatGPT resembles cool media in terms of its prioritizing process as opposed to a product. Process versus product distinction is one that differentiates cool participatory processual media from hot media. Finally, I would like to apply McLuhan's tetrad in examining ChatGPT. Tetrad is the fourfold model that he devised to examine different media. It asks four following questions. What does the technology enhance or amplify? What does the technology make obsolete or replace? What does the technology retrieve or bring back from the past? What does the technology flip into when pushed to its extreme? For example, if you apply Tetra to radio, you'd get the following result. Radio extending the ear into high definition enhances our ability to hear, amplifying news and music by a sound. It obsolesces the need to be physically present in order to hear something. Radio, by virtue of contracting the world into a global village, gives its consumers the power to hear things in spite of physical barriers, such as walls and houses. It also tries to replace printed and visual material. Radio retrieves the oral culture and magic tribalism of shamanism by virtue of affecting the ear, hence bringing back the collectivism and shared experiences, which were lost in the individualist, disengaged visual world of printed books. Thus, radio returns the power of the spoken word. And finally, if pushed to the extreme, it flips into audiovisual TV. Now, to get back to ChatGPT, it would enhance the ability of processual dialogue and dialectical learning, which is lost in the cool medium of search engines. It makes obsolete or replaces a multiplicity of information that is disconnected and decontextualized, such that we often encounter on Wikipedia and Google, and surpassing the schizophrenic mode of Deleuze. It retrieves seminar-type dialectical learning, mechanical linearity, arborocentric mode of information, and centralization of knowledge into a meaningful narrative. Hence, one follows a train of thought instead of being struck by a simultaneity and all at oneness. As for what it would flip into when pushed to its extreme, deserves another video. So I would like you to write down your answers to this question, as I have praised the cool medium of participation all along. What makes ChatGPT so alarming and dangerous is that it posits a pretension to the theory of humanness. Now, one thing about the complexity of humans is that we do not have a theory that would encapsulate human nature into a set of variables that would allow the model to make predictions. So, to give you a comparison, we have a theory of Jupiter. A theory as in a vision, whereby we can explain Jupiter's behavior by reducing it to a set of variables. This allows scientists to measure and predict Jupiter's future states with extremely high precision. 
Zoologists and ethologists, for example, have theories about animals. So, for example, we can predict their behavior and migration with high precision, which is possible by virtue of animals being more robot-like and hence simpler than humans. Now, when it comes to humans, although there is huge scientific and sociological slash philosophical knowledge with regards to human behavior, be it on an individual or on a collective level, one still cannot claim to have a working theory of human nature that you can apply in particular situations. Even if you do not believe in free will and you are a proponent of biological and physical determinism, the variables that play into human decision-making are so uncapturable that it is still impossible to predict human behavior with high precision. Now, the scary aspect of chat GPT is that it is specifically trained on human speech. Now, speech and human language are definitely not the alpha and omega of human nature. There is a lot of humanity that is left behind when a person articulates his thoughts and feelings through the filter of language. Nonetheless, as Heidegger points out, language houses being. And by accessing the intricacies of human speech, which is one of the best gateways to the theory of humanity, one becomes able to recreate the illusion of humanness. There is a concept known as the uncanny valley. This describes the uncomfortable, unsettling feeling that grips humans when they encounter an artificial resemblance of them, such as an android that looks quite like them, but still isn't realistic enough to be considered a human. Now, Chai GPT, with its very much human-like text generation, harbors the potential to pass the threshold of the uncanny valley and come closer to what we generally understand as human nature. And chat GPT might become one of the greatest tools to achieve the long-sought Western obsession of wresting the reproductive powers from the feminine realm, hence recreating a human android. The history and attempt of Western thinkers to create its semblance go back to the early Middle Ages, and it deserves another video on its own. Now I want to thank my Patreons who are helping this channel and are motivating me to do more videos. Thank you again, and stay tuned.